class. Um, but if you are, good. Can I give you back your thing now? It will respond. Greeks make chip sets. Okay, so for those of you that know what you're I don't like, this one said I don't like PCs. Uh, Having said that, where is the, so where's your memory uh, here? Is it going to go to computer? No, it's going to go to town. No, it's going to go to town. This one. Yeah. It doesn't recognize me. It's not recognizing it. Mm. Right. Oh, yeah. No. This one? Local system? No. No, it's my computer. Can you uh, remove it and let it in again? I didn't seem to have a bit about that. Is this, one thinking now. is this one connected to the web? Oh, oh is this one? 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 Is Party music. What's in there? Spice girls. One more than other things. Party music. <laughs> Okay. 
resolution is well to the degree to which there is a resolution so that that's the idea here so the problem is that the question of identity who am I who are we what's it all about Alfie breaking into song uh, has been a vexed question and in for example a lot of your lives a lot of my life um, our lives things like uh, the woman's movement um, the uh, gay struggles, um, any of these kind of things, were all based on what would be called identity politics. So, so I'm going to try and make it as clear as possible about this. Now, this is not to say that identity politics aren't important or haven't been important or won't remain important, but it is to say that one's own identity has to be thought slightly differently than the kind of political landscape that creates the movement. Uh, or anyway, that's the suggestion that's being put on the table. Because what's being said with Heidegger's move, and what then becomes the basis of almost all of, register your software, anyway, <laughs> becomes the basis of all of postmodernism, is the way in which identity is understood as a relation. By which is not meant that you are this embodied thing that is in relation to the out there, and that's where the relation is. Identity is literally the linking of those two features, of this thing called, let's say, little b being, or what he calls man, which I hate using that term, though I do think little b being is a little bit excessive, but anyway, um, and you end up sounding like you're talking in a very odd language, but anyway. What, what he's saying is that if you take as a, as a given the who am I, and you answer it with the question, I am X, I am woman, hear me roar, I am, you know, whatever, the X, and then you go off and you find out things about yourself, you will never find out about yourself or any self, is part of what's going on here. So the arguments that, let's say, particularly in the trans movement, where uh, one is uh, male to female, or female to male, and the argument is, I, I needed to go to become male from being female, because inside me is this thing called female. And then I go off and I look for my, my moment of female, or the same thing with male, I look for this. What Heidegger is saying, and what became part of the entire postmodern movement, and he wasn't saying this on purpose. He, Heidegger is not like a political animal. He's, well, he is a political animal, but the wrong political animal. He, what he's saying is that you will never find your identity this way. Trans, male, hermaphrodite, androgynous, whatever it is, it's, it doesn't occupy the space that way. It, Identity has to bring in this relational moment. So he says that if you go off thinking, I am this and go find it, then really what's happening is you're engaging in a Hegelian move. You're taking this concept, let's say called woman, or black, or robot, or whatever it is, and you're, you're becoming embodied into it. So you're taking thought, an absolute concept of thought, and you're becoming one with this thought. And this is something that is not unusual because this is the basis of all metaphysics. 
2,000 years worth of thinking does this move. And the, the, the situation is, is that in, let's say, the, the 19th century, the 20th century, and the 21st century, all the identity politics movements are based on this. So it's not that it hasn't had its, uh, its you know, run, its good run, good innings, as they say. Now, and, and, and I have to say that also, if there's a law that says you cannot drive because you have female genitals, clearly a woman's movement on this level is required. So, so try and see how I'm, I'm going to park that for a moment, because we're going to come back to the political side to this. I want you to get this, this sort of other level that's going on here. So what Heidegger argues is that to understand what it is to be me, you have to understand that the me of I, or the I of me, is situated in a location. And the location doesn't have a ground, doesn't have a, doesn't have a foundation. So it's a location without a base, hence the groundless ground. It's a location, it's a spatial moment. It's not a temporal moment. Now this is a big break with his earlier work, so if you get confused and you think, I know what I'm going to do, I'm going to read the earlier work of, of Heidegger because I have nothing else to do on a Saturday, and I'm going to read Being in Time. Note. This is against being in time. So Heidegger has changed his mind. Okay, so try and remember that part. A lot of people don't remember that part, including Heideggerians. Okay, so, and you might want to ask yourself, do you have the right to change your mind when you become famous? You know, Marx, for example. Did he have the right? To, is Marx the same Marxist from the Communist Manifesto all the way up to the Grundrisse? Perhaps. I mean, obviously on one level, but on another level, question mark. So, do people have the, do you have the right to change your mind once you learn something? Yes. Of course you do. So, unfortunately, the publishing house doesn't think this, or the way in which the, the time lags go. So beware of that when you read. Beware of the fact that when Wittgenstein wrote uh, Philosophical Investigations, after he wrote this book, it became the, he was like the, the, the person of, to have the flavor of the month. Everyone loved him, everyone wanted him at their dinner parties. You know, and he realized it was completely wrong. And so he called up all the publishing houses and tried to get them to retract it. Of course, they wouldn't. You know, can you imagine calling up Random House or, you know, Rutledge or something? Please don't print this book that you just spent money on. You know, it's completely wrong. You know, and also people like Bertrand Russell thought it was brilliant, so that didn't help either. You know, they can say, oh, they're there. You're just having a nervous breakdown. You know, and he was like, no, it's ter totally wrong. So, Unfortunately, when Wittgenstein is taught in, in universities and schools, they forget that part. They always start with philosophical investigations, or they, not, not, not philosophical, sorry, it's the Tractatus. That, that's what was, he, that was his only book he ever wrote, and he, it was wrong. All the other books that have his name listed to it are what his students wrote. So they were sitting around in a seminar like this, and, and Wittgenstein had an inability to finish writing anything. So the students wrote all the books for him. There's like six of them that wrote all his books. Anyway, that's just it. Now, I tell you this because I want you to get a sense of what's at stake in understanding this, particularly now in today's world, because I think it is absolutely resonant with a, a digital world or a media arts world or a world that is located in technology, by which we don't mean literally the cell phone or the mobile phone, but we mean that that helps understand the role of techno the role of the logic of techna in making something cohere. And once something can cohere, you have meaning. And once you have meaning, you have identity. So that's his step. What comes first is not identity. What comes first is not thought. What, com what comes first is cohering, is the ability to make something stick. And here's where being an artist comes in handy, because for reasons that we'll explore in the seminar, there's something about being an artist that gets the cohering process. I'm not going to say you're all little geniuses running around, God forbid, your heads will go, you know, you'll be able to get through the door, but, but there's something about the ability to figure out that, that when you're looking at color, and when you're looking at dimension, and when you're looking at space, you, you see something else. It's like, 
Does anybody is anybody colorblind in this room? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. How can you be a little bit colorblind? <laughs> I don't recognize certain colors. They're the same. Okay, that's colorblind. That is colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know if you've got a I have a brother who uh, is colorblind, and uh, he's able, as a result, to see things very magnified. It's it's because he can pretty much see black and white. It doesn't mean he can't see color at all. Because he can't see reds and greens, and probably have the same mm. problem as it's called one. He sees, he can always find hair and food. It's fascinating. You know, you can go out for dinner, you can be sure that wherever we go, a hair will be in the food because he will find it. Which makes me think that the amount of hair I've eaten. See, <laughs> 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 anyway. <laughs> well, exactly. exactly. Watch out. <laughs> have you seen this video that's going viral right now called uh, Dogs vs. Cats? I'll send it to you guys. It's so funny. It's uh, the, uh, where uh, there, there's, it was basically these like five gay men put together this dogs versus cat thing, and one guy is uh, a cat, and one guy is the dog, and one guy is like the owner of the two of them, and one guy is the friend that comes over, and then one guy is I don't know holding the camera or something. Anyway, and the cat is totally hilarious because this guy just walks over everybody, and at one point the guy's sleeping, and he slaps the guy and wakes up, and he says. Or out of cereal. <laughs> I mean, it's fantastic. Whereas the dog is like, hi, hi, how's it going? It's <laughs> good. It's a good. It's good. Anyway, sorry. Okay. Back to this. So, <laughs> so the thing is, um, identity is not what you start with. Identity is where the expression lies. So there is no in between, in a sense. There might be an ish, there might be a kind of dimensional scenario where you have blue-ish, red-ish, green-ish. But even when I say blue, red, green, there's no essence as in substance to blue, red. There's no thought that precedes the green in order for it to happen. So what Hegel is, I'm sorry, what Heidegger is actually privileging here is experience but in his way, okay? So it's not normal forms of experience. So he's saying that one has to account for the ground, except the ground doesn't exist as such. The ground, wait, let me start again. One has to understand how something comes to make sense. When I say make sense, I literally mean the making of sense, the producing, the needing, the making of sense. You have to have your body to make the sense happen. You can't just have the mind hovering around in this kind of detached, actually you could have a mind hovering around, for those of you that are eyebrow about the robotic thing, you can see that happening. Uh, but it's not the mind in the Hegelian sense, it's not the thought that becomes the basis that ties things together. Are we kind of okay on this. So the next thing to think about is that he gets into the way he presents the argument in Identity and Difference, which is probably his most important text for, let's say, postmodernism, is that he says that if you think of this as A, if you think of this tangerine as A, this unpeelable tangerine, so please help yourself to it because I find it annoying. Um, if you find that this is A. What Hegel would say is that the question becomes, how does A think itself? How does A understand itself, as it were? How does A know that it's a tangerine? It's tangerineness. It's got its essence. And that notion of the essence is what infects identity politics today. And if nothing else, by accident or otherwise, the gay movement um, by which is not meant male gay, by which is meant that which is not, um, that, that which is trying to come up with a different type of form of sexualities, a queer, I think it's called queer these days. Um, God, do I sound old? Ah, these days, when I was a child, it was gay. Anyway, um, the point is, is that it's not against being straight. It's not, a, it, it's it coming up with a constitution, a constitution, no, that's not the word I want, constitutive. It's assembling. It's assembling something. The very 
I would say the very first version of that is in feminism. The feminism had a, a statement in their little battle cry that said, biology is not destiny. And with that battle cry, biology is not destiny, many things were quite interesting because suddenly it became a problem when women were wearing, did you know in Paris they just repealed uh, the act that said women couldn't wear pants? Because that was, because if you wore trousers, uh, at some point when, you know, in the insanity of the world, you'd have to report to a police station and get permission from the police if you're a female, where could you be seen as impersonating a man? Anyway, you know, you, like I said, you just can't make this stuff up. It's just like, the reality is so much more insane. Anyway, the point is, is that feminism was one of the first attempts at saying biology is not there is no substance to biology. There's no essence to biology. And that was a kind of interesting argument because it then meant, if that's true, if that really is true, then why do we have all these stupid rules about men and women, black and white, Muslim and Jew, Christian, blah, blah, blah. Why are these rules happening? If it is true that there is no substance in this sense, if it is true that biology is not destiny, then that's kind of an interesting problem. And that's the first wave of feminism. So the first wave of feminism actually then took that and said, well, if that's the case, then why aren't women getting educated? Why aren't women voting? Why aren't women wearing pants or these idiotic hoop skirts that were going on? Which are great if you're having a wild sex party or you're having like an interesting costume moment. Those are interesting outfits. I, I have nothing against an interesting outfit. But if they restrict your ability to walk or move in the world, it seems a problem. Why, why climb a mountain without the proper hiking boots? It just seems mad. Although I did that once. Because I didn't realize I was climbing a mountain. But anyway, I had on the very shoes I have on now, which don't do if you climb a mountain because they're very slippery. And at 1,000 meters above the ground, where I could see deep crevices, and you had these gazelle type of Sherpa type people leaping up and they'd say, why don't we take a break and smoke a cigarette? I'm like, smoke a cigarette where you can hardly breathe? There's like no air up here, it's like so thin. And then you look down and you think, I'm going to die in a very stupid thing because I didn't have the right shoes on. Okay. So if you think about this, there's no essence. <laughs> Sorry, that wasn't good of a tangent. Even I can say that as a tangent. Um, the, point, the point is here that that Hegel would say that there's an essence, and that essence has to come to fruition. Now, in a lot of political movements, I'm going to pick on the feminist movement because that's my movement, as it were. Well, I claim a couple of movements, but that's one of them. Um, in feminism, there, would, there was a move that was so angry at patriarchy that the argument became, there is something very different about being female. Okay, maybe it's not biology is destiny, but after being tortured by patriarchy for so long, then there's, it, people just have to be in safe environment. <coughs> this was the whole argument about the safe environment question. And again, that started, while politically it made a lot of sense, it started then saying, well, there must be something that's inherent about being female. Or later on, it mutates into inherent about being gay, male, or inherent about being queer, or inherent about being trans, inherent about being black, inherent about being male. Yeah, it's just annoying after a while. You know? so for whatever reasons, people tend to, groups tend to coagulate back to Hegel. The Hegel that says that knowledge that the, that the thing in itself, that we studied so desperately last time and everybody had wrinkle eyebrows, that the thing in itself is the truth of its being. Now, with uh, feminist work, with what would later be called Foucauldian discursive theories, there is no discovery, because there's no ground, you're not digging deep for anything. There's no depth, you're just figuring out how these things get constituted, how they get assembled. So with Heidegger, what he said in last week's discussion and in his identity paper, his identity chapter, he says that 
the way you understand what this is by itself is you understand that it belongs to another one that looks similar to it. So there's a belonging. And, and at the same time, there's a way of keeping it apart. Otherwise, it would be crushed. So there's a belonging. And yet, they're not crushing each other. So because if, if they came together, there would be no way to see what it was. You can't understand the is. You can't understand the present. In fact, as you know with Hegel, Hegel doesn't have any relationship to the present. Remember we did that thing with here, where's here, here, you know, every time you try and grab is, every time you grab the present, it jumps somewhere else. The present keeps, you know, the present is the future or it's past, but it's never here. Because if it's always here and you're in a Hegelian model, you can't get out of it. It's like goo. It sticks to you. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. I can't get out of it. So you can't really account for change. You can only account for change as something that someone comes in from outside or something comes in from outside. In Hegel's world, it's God. In fact, in most people's world, it's God. It comes in and sort of magically changes things and makes things change. So for Hegel, there is this evolution, but there's never revolution. This was Marx's point. Marx was saying, okay, all very interesting. And Marx was not that far from, Marx is a Hegelian, or was a Hegelian, he's dead. But he was arguing that, yes, there's the concept, and you must learn what that concept does and how it is itself multifaceted. But the problem with Hegel's work is that there was no room for revolution. There's only evolution. Now with Heidegger, he's saying that identity belongs. That's the first thing, this thing that sticks them together. It's um, like saying be the person with you. The personhood is the result of relationships. Yes. You and I belong together in the world called human in the world called intellectual, in the world called artist. We belong together. But at the same time, we're not literally the same. Because if we were, can someone, um, Dane, you know how this thing works. <laughs> now, you notice I put blue tackle over yeah. it. Can you get that, can you just turn it on? We, we just need a, a nut to come out of that that's, that I can work with. Um, I put that outside for people, and it got broken. OK, excellent, thank you. <laughs> no, there's a, it has an eye. It, it's an all-seeing, all-doing. Uh, can I just have one that looks like it's crushable? Oh. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, perfect. Okay, now let's pretend that this is little b being, and this is big b being. This is Dasein, right? This is the there. And we know that, that the human being is attracted to Dasein. And Dasein is pulled to the, the human being. But if there was no way to keep it apart, Dasein would crush a person, right? And nothing would be left. So you still either have just Dasein, great, helpful, but you know, look what happened to poor little little bee being crushed. And then we need another one. <laughs> <laughs> you ate it. You ate Dasein. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Or let's say little b being thought, I'm going to become Dasein. Well, you know, what happens? Where did it go? It's still swallowed up, right? You can't find it any longer. So what Heidegger says is that a very odd thing happens. He wants to make an argument that the is, we're going to do the same size because it would be way too messy. Okay, you know, although I want different size scenarios going on. This is first of all an identity. So the is is this thing in between. See, see between here, this one, and this one, there, that bit, that's the is. The is includes these two points. It's not that these two points are sitting outside the is. So that your example, or one, how did Martin's example of a equals a, with the a on either side of the equal point, just in your mind bring them into the equal, bring them into the pond, except they're still apart from each other. He calls that the event of appropriation. 
that's the first part of understanding how identity is established. It, there's an event that happens. There's an assemblage that happens. And this is what you all do as artists. This is why I use Heidegger, despite the fact of his you know, Nazi proclivities. I use him because he gets the technique of being an artist. He gets what it is to, to understand that there is always the is that is the primary feature of identity. But that is, that's the primary, see, see this is? <laughs> it's like this is that's holding apart these two things that keeps them together at the same time. He's calling that the event. The event of appropriation. They appropriate the belong, they, they, they connect with each other. But they don't connect so tightly that they're, you know, that they smush each other, that they crush each other. They connect just like that. They just they, they, so there's like almost like magnets that are opposite poles. You know how magnets north south do that with each other. Well, in fact, they do this because they don't. Anyway, the point is that they're, they're like so. Now, he then says in identity, uh, in the identity lecture, that the interesting thing about this is that the famous Parmenides. Did I say that right? Where, where, where is Peñota when she was like correcting me? Where'd she go? She in that bloody uh, opening. Uh, so, Parmenides. That was it. Parmenides. Just it seems like he's a knee deep or something. Parmenides. <laughs> so I, remember, I know it's got to register your software on it. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, um, we'll get rid of that in a second. Um, when he makes the argument, when he says, and we go to Parmenides to make a discussion about um, how this works, he's saying that what Parmenides did was he made the argument that, that speaking, the orality of something forms this pond, this unseeable, unsayable thing that still exists. And he's calling that spatial. So these guys are trying to figure out how, how are we going to talk about something that later on with Einstein is cracked. They figure out how to talk about this. We'll, you know, we'll get to this, how this cohering. Just note Einstein comes into this in this moment. So you have this sort of thing that's being set together. They're appropriating each other, Dasein and little b being. Dasein and little b being appropriate each other, and together that creates being. A different way of putting this problem. Did, first of all, do you understand that? Do, questions on that. So there's a spatial, think spatial, think dimension. Don't think temporal yet. Don't think either or. Don't think contradiction. Because the great advance of Hegel was to understand that at least if you're going to be obsessive about the way in which thought pre-configures action, at least you'll realize that thought is itself constituted through, by a contradiction. So that's, you know, big a big leap forward. But what Heidegger is saying is that, unfortunately, that only sidesteps the problem. And what is not clear is that actually what is the basis of identity is what, do you think? Difference. Difference. Who said that? Very good. Jacob. Difference is at the basis of identity. Now, that doesn't mean like what Heidegger, pardon me, that doesn't mean what Hegel was saying. Remember what Hegel was saying? It was that in every concept, you have all that there is and all that there's not taken together. One is sublated, creates a synthesis, comes back around and creates the ground. The ground then gives meaning to those two sides. Remember that? That the famous acorn unfolding. So you have the telos that unfolds while simultaneously having this whole dance going on. You've not heard this before, have you? Because I have heard about two years ago, so I do Okay, right, okay, good. So you heard, so thesis, antithesis, taken together, creates the whole of the reality. All that there is, plus all that there's not, so nothing is left out of your, your thought pattern here. And Hegel, and Heidegger says, that's the first problem, because 
the way you're conceiving this GWF, the way you're conceiving this all that there is and all that, that's not how reality operates. There is no all that there is and all that there's not taken together makes the whole picture. Because it's not a whole picture. There's no outside to the picture. If there were an outside of the picture, then it would be difficult to argue that things didn't come from out there, like an Archimedean point, like a god, like something comes in and changes reality. Parenthesis, just, just a parenthesis, just for a moment, while, while you're, one side of your mind is thinking this true. The Pope, I just want to mention this. <coughs> it, it is fantastic that somebody who is able to sublate and become divine can then resign from that <laughs> and go back to being a person. I give him full marks for this. You know, I think it's great. You know, yes, I'm divine. No, I'm not divine. You know, I'm tired of it. I can't handle it. Anymore. I think it's fantastic that he finally, that finally, you know, um, he abdicates. I think, it's, I think it's brilliant. The notion of abdication in the moment when the monarchy has very cleverly resurrected itself in this country via Kate and William. You know, I mean, it was a lost leader with the, um, what's his name? The other one, the son, Charles. You know, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, he just, you know, he was, he was just such a disappointment, you know, um, for, the, for the poor godmother, god stroke mother, I mean. So the idea that the monarchy would have a divine right to rule is a very potent thing, all the more so with the Pope. And the idea that you can abdicate from that is a fantastic concept. That you can jump outside of your divineness and become, I don't know what, a demigod or something, or something else. And whether it's right or wrong, or, you know, personally, my own little you know, tiny view of this, I don't know what other people think about this, is that I'm sure he's involved in the sex child scandal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and, then, yeah, and he's, he's been caught. Yeah, he, he's been caught with his, his hand in the cookie jar, as it were. And he can't, uh, he can't get out of it. And, you know, and I just hope they rake it to the coals for that, if that is the case. Um, but um, having said that, the point is, is that it is interesting that Heidegger is creating the first secular version of being. So, that, so all the other one, all of metaphysics up to now, in fact, metaphysics, is basically theological. It requires God at some stage of the game. Because it tries to answer the why question. And the why question will always lead you back to God. Because, you know, why is blue blue? God. You know, I mean, well, you could say, well, you know, the light waves, the frame, you know, this kind of thing, you know, whatever the, the dots. And, but eventually, it leads back to God. Whereas Heidegger is not concerned with the why question. He's concerned with how does it manifest itself. And it's the how question that is so much a part of being an artist. Also a scientist, by the way. And that's what is shared between those two otherwise completely incompatible fields. It's at the curiosity to see how something is assembled. And that assemblage is spatial, dimensional. I'm going to keep banging on about this. So, so what he says, what Heidegger says, is that if you get out of the sense of a totality, if, you, if you're going to try and think about who am I, what is my purpose, how does that work? It's only the how does it work is going to maybe answer that question. But in fact, he says it doesn't really answer the question. He basically is saying, that at the basis of all identity is not the deep cut of contradiction, all that there is versus all that there's not taken together to create the whole picture. What's at the basis of identity is this belonging and wanting to be. And that he names difference. And difference is entirely different than this thing called sticking things together and making them cohere. Runs the identity. Difference is in a different kind of level of making the comment. It's like it making the um, making it understood that you're talking about something.
completely other. And by other, he's not talking about a sociological category. He's not talking about Jew or woman or, or animal. He's not talking about this. He's talking about other, like not of this world, not of this level of discussion. He doesn't mean God. I don't mean other at that level. I mean, it's like you think of one line going this way into infinity and the other one in an askew form going another way. They never meet. They're other to each other. They can never meet. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so you have difference as the ground of identity. But it's a funny ground because it's just the is. So the is has three sides to it. The is, you can say, is a place. And for those of you that do like to go mountain climbing and, and dealing, and a lot of people here are dealing with uh, landscape, whether it's the body landscape or it's the landscape of you know outside the nature and so on and so forth, that this this is a spatial environment around which it brings one into the now, viscerally. By visceral, I mean smell, blood, sweat, emotion. So the is isn't this sort of vacant, never to be reached, never to be dealt with environment. It's precisely the reverse. It's this coagulating, messy thing that connects, that, 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 that becomes the, the name of the placeholder that keeps them both apart and together. That's the is. So it's a very particular place. That's the first part of is. Sure. Okay. So the first part of is, is saying that it's a place, it's a dwelling, as Heidegger would later call it, it's a clearing. I mean, I do find Heidegger irritating on these particular levels. Thank God he's translated into English, or I think I would have to, you know, I would never go over, you know, because I think in German it sounds particularly um, fascistic, basically. The fatherland, the dwelling, and you suddenly you feel like you have to start saluting and goose-stepping or something, it's really, you know, very tragic. Um, and when you, um, when I was in Cologne giving the first lecture they had had on Heidegger since Heidegger, um, and that's because, um, and it, 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 it was, I, 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 you know, it wasn't lost on me being Jewish, speaking in Cologne on Heidegger, you know, where the Germans had completely banned him. I thought, oh, God, again, you couldn't make this stuff up. You know, it's just like unbelievable. But. What he's saying is that this dwelling, in fact, we had a discussion saying that reading Heidegger in English was more palatable than reading him in the German, and I can, I can see that. So the Heidegger I know, because I don't read German very well, um, the Heidegger I know is an English translated German, not the German Heidegger, which is important. Same with Nietzsche. In fact, same with all the Germans. <laughs> anyway, the point is that, so this is, is a dwelling is a dwelling. Well, is number one. And in that dwelling, all things are possible. But some things are more possible than others. Because think about the dwelling being a river between two banks. And you're in that river. And you're drowning. And what's that going to be like? not so much fun. You're being pulled under by the undertow, the water's going up your nostrils, you can't see, you're freaked out, there's all this fear. It's all in there. That's in the dwelling. It's not like you're sitting there with Rousseau smoking a joint going, it's this wonderful dwelling. You know, how lovely is this? No, the dwelling can be that, but it's also all of these things. It's, it's what keeps things tied together and apart. It's an event. This is the dwelling. This is the it, the first side. Does that make more sense, John? No. So just, just try and remember yeah, this. Yes, yeah, not good. So the is is spatial in this sense, but this spatiality, wait for it, has seven letters to it. This spatiality has seven letters. So this spatiality is called A, seven letters, starts with an S. 
surface. <clears throat> so now let's go back to that for a second. A painful surface question. <laughs> Not to point out to anyone. The painful surface. <laughs> you're in the dwelling. You're drowning. You, you've been slipped under. You're lost. Water in your nostrils, freaking out. You're still in a surface. So this surface is a weird surface, because this surface, you could say, has depth. But it's not the depth like if you dug down in the ground, you find something rooted. It's a surface that allows for this something else to go on within the surface. And now we're going to get into how you understand, in your own work, texture. How you understand these other things that people don't know: tone, uh, shading. These are not deep things. They are not things that you know uh, necessarily uh, give something its essence. They give it its character, and the character is established because of these two relations. So the spatial. There's a big discussion in sculpture about this about the relation of a form as a dimension, as opposed to as uh, you know, something that you, uh, as opposed to like 3D, 4D, D. I'm not talking about it at that level. I mean this, this, I'm talking about a shaft of light. I'm talking about a dimension in that sense, leaving God out. So it's like, ooh, it's more like Teletubbies, for anybody who has children, has had the Teletubbies moment, or anybody as a child has watched Teletubbies. Does anybody know what Teletubbies is? It's like a ridiculous example. You know, with that kind of really awful face of the sun, smiling. And you just think, the Aryan world is just on us with Teletubbies. Anyway, um, OK. So you've got this. So the second part of the is. The first part of the is is that it's spatial. And that spatiality, its ability to be there at all is created by this thing called an event of appropriation. What's being appropriated? The little b being is appropriating Dasein. The big b being, Dasein, is appropriating man or the human. That's the event of appropriation. And they don't appropriate so strongly that they smash each other, because if they did that, it would kind of be not so good. You wouldn't have any understanding. You wouldn't have any meaning. So in fact, in your work, if you appropriate so strongly that you do that, that it ends up smashing everything up, it's not going to make any sense. So you can tell, like with atonal music, when it works, it's because it's not, it's not collapsed onto each other. Anyway, I just went off on a tangent there, so just maybe it works for you, great. Now, so the second thing about this is, is that it has depth. But again, it's not the depth of Newtonian physics or of Hegelian metaphysics. It's a depth that we will come to know very easily in the information age. It's a depth that allows you to have in your iPad, say iPad, iPad, <laughs> iPad, 60,000 files. It's a very peculiar depth. It has contours. It in itself can be understandable, sort of. But if you broke it open, you would see nothing. And yet, it's not, we're not talking about the supernatural is not inside the computer. We're not saying that some ghost is lurking in there and secretly a little elf is secretly putting everything together. When you, you ask them to like come up with a file, the elf picks it out and you know gives it to you secretly. No. We know, because we're secular, we're modern. We know that there's no being inside the computer. There is simply some form of dimension that's going on. <coughs> and that dim dimension has depth. But maybe depth isn't the best way of putting that word. So what Heidegger calls it is difference. So now we know that is 
one level is difference, and then there's things within the difference that's different. Knowable points that come come to mind. So he starts to say, let's see if there's a different way of talking about this. And he brings in two different words. One is perdurance. It's a fun word. I actually like that word because it is simply incomprehensible, this word. I have taught this for years, perdurance, and still I call it different versions of what I think it is. Did, did anybody give it a go? Did anybody look at this word? Yeah, she uh, looked that word up in the dictionary. And what'd you find? It? See, never go to dictionary. They, they don't know. <laughs> you know they, they, all they tell you is what you're looking for, and that's, that's tautology. You know, so what did, what did the dictionary tell you? Um, everlasting. Everlasting. Mm. Everlasting Lee. Everlasting Lee. Did that help you? <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody else bit, yeah. take a endurance, look? Endurance, because it's endurance. So, it's so endurance. endurance, so something can endure for a while. What does it tell you if there's something that's going on for a while? There's time. Time. Yeah. And so there's something that means that this thing that's being set up like this in between has a form of in, of infiniteness that creates matter, that matters. It's just that the matter it creates is like your file in your computer. It's not very helpful. I mean, it's very helpful. And what's wonderful about the geeks who have named all these things and helped the rest of us along is that rather than calling it perdurance, they call it things like memory chip or the mouse. So it, it's, you can play not that the mouse ones in, they, they name things in the computer that's accessible. So you don't feel like you're like, you know. In fact, when the, when the computer was first evolving in its little cell in ARPA, in ARPANET, um, they had a um, uh, discussion as to what would they call these things. Should they call it like WT, blah, 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 you know, you know something like this. And people said, no, nah, call it something crazy, you know, like, you know, like literally Google. Let's Google. I mean, it's like Dada. Only Google, goo goo, da da da. And I'm glad they did that. I'm glad they didn't call it something really serious with a one eyebrow type of thing. I'm glad the philosophers weren't in charge. Can you imagine? Good job. <laughs> 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 you know? I mean, it would be like just awful. But that gives you an idea. So the World Wide Web is kind of like your perdurance. Now, the World Wide Web is not a search engine. So don't think of perdurance as a search engine. Think of perdurance as this thing that can go on infinitely expanding. But there's no outside to the web. Because to think outside of the web is not to understand how the web operates. There's no outside, there's no really inside. There just is the web. It is. So that's point number three about is. Point number let me just finish that sentence. Yeah. Point number three about the is, is is that there's no edge. Okay, go ahead. There's no outside, and there's no inside. And if you're going to talk about interiority or exteriority, then you must always remember that you're you're talking about it in terms of identity and difference. You're not talking about it in terms of psychology. Well all the psychology people in the, in the room. Um, you could be talking about it in terms of psychology, but if you really want to understand psychology, it would be helpful to understand it in terms of identity and difference. Okay, Tom. I, I guess about, um, is it like I am becoming what I am becoming? Not quite. Which is a Yahweh. It is, it is I am becoming what I am becoming, but if it's a Yahweh thing, I can say yes, that would be close to that. Yeah, but if it, if it's just meant to be a tautology, then no. But that's why the A is A, and then you know they and now for the you know drum roll thing that we've changed into I equals I is kind of like, uh huh, okay. Did I miss something here in the drum roll moment when they unveiled the great leap from A equals A to I equals I? Did you read that when when he goes? And the most important thing now is about Fichte. 
from Fichte and Schelling, and they go, they move from, you know, the horrible A equals A, which, which he's damning and hates, to the I equals I, and you're like, um, that's just a different letter, actually. <laughs> How did that happen? But pretend, for the sake of not going insane, that the I equals I is really asking, who are, who are I? Who am I? <laughs> so that who are you? But who, who am I? Who, what makes me me? And it's not enough to say that I, this thing called Johnny, is in relationship to this thing called John. Is it, that's not enough because it, that would really be, you know, then I am all that you are not and you are all that I am not. We're back to Hegel again. There's something else that goes on where that which really is constituting who I am is not sayable. Because at some point, what Heidegger is saying is that you can really only point to difference. You can't actually talk about difference because you have to use language, and language is already metaphysical. So you can't actually describe the thing because you're using the same tool to try and explain it. And that's why art, again, has this, it's not magical, it just, it names the process, it names the communication process that can handle difference that knows how to wear those toxic gloves to be able to handle it. So the crucial thing here is that, is that the is is both a place, as in dwelling. The is is also a duration. as in this perdurance thing. You know, and it has no third point, it has no inside or outside. Maybe that's part of the second point, because there's a sub point, the fourth point of the three B or something point. Which is that if you talk about the is as the to be, like like the verb, the infinitive is is to be, right? You know what when I say the word infinitive, I don't mean infinity, I mean the infinitive of form like to swim. To, to walk to something, so that's an infinitive form of verb. And that's also an interesting concept, by the way. When you just think about grammar, the infinitive form of a verb, a verb is a transitive moment. It gets things moving. And there's an infinitive form, so there's this freeze frame form of the moving part thinking that's already wrapped into language. This is the to be, to something, to walk, to talk. But when you get to to be, that's just a creepy version. Because the to be is the only verb, that's why they use being, by the way, it's the only verb that talks about being static and at the same time has this thing about the future. Because it brings in an ethical, it brings in what ought to happen, what is to be, to be or not to be, what is to be, that the future, that, that ought, so the being, the, the to be, has an ethical component. So all identity deals with a form of ethics. And I want to bang on about that because we can get on to that in a discussion. But I just want to point that out, that let's say 3B of the three forms of is, or in fact number four, depending on if you want the third form of the is to be no inside and outside, or you want that no inside and outside to be hooked on to uh, perdurance. Depends on, you know, <laughs> you know however, you, however it works for you at the moment, you know. But this next part to remember is that it implies a future. Now, again, it's not the future as in past, present, future. So maybe future is the wrong word. Here's where it gets even trickier than you thought it was getting. It implies what they would call an elsewhere. So now the future is just somewhere else. And what Heidegger says, and I'm hoping, did you have a question? No, I no. Okay. <laughs> See, I saw you at the front of my eye. I saw part of that hair moving. <laughs> he calls 
this ability to get this event of appropriation to start working and the way in which one understands the to be the, as the future or the elsewhere as two different sides of, of this question. One, he's going to call it a standing reserve. The standing reserve, you got your two things. You got your, you got our, our you know, little b being and our Dasein. Okay? We have our lots of little b beings. In the sense of this. <coughs> That's why this thing. In fact, that's the apple. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, so you have these little bee beings in relation to the Dasein, and they appropriate each other. That's the event of appropriation. Now, it could have been, you know, this could have been out here, and this could have been appropriated. So you will say that what stands around. What lies to hand, as what uh, Wittgenstein might call it, is part of this thing called the standing reserve. So you could have connected it this way, but maybe this one could have been connected. It's arbitrary. It's relative, but it's not arbitrary. It's relative to what is around, but it's not like you know just picking something and just bringing mm -hmm. it in. Now I'm going to come back to that. So so he calls that there's a standing reserve. There's this thing called the event of appropriation. And when it's set, of course, you know that the setting of it is not going to be permanent. But when it sets up this cohesion, that's an enframing. So there's a framing, or an end framing, he calls it, or the framework. And the framework creates this ability to name. Once you can name, you got your identity. Now, that's a far cry from Hegel, who starts with the identity and goes forward. He starts with the con starts with thought, thought being as thought. Whereas what Heidegger is saying is that thought belongs to being, being belongs to thought. But they're not the same thing, and, and if one comes before the other, it's being that comes before thought. Of course, it kind of can't come before each other, because the notion of before doesn't exist in this argument. This is a very different sense of time, and of space, and of gathering. This is what I'm trying to get you to hear. Okay. Before I get on to the next section, let's just <coughs> see what we've heard on this. Stuart? Um, I'm sort of jumping ahead with things like depth and thinking of multiplicity. Is that the thing you're using? Yeah, yeah, is, that, is, that, is that the same? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's the same deal as one or the other? Well, it's not the same deal. It's a slightly different deal. Okay. Um, let, let's. let's just stick with this for the time being, because what they're going to do is develop this. Because right. if you stick with this Heideggerian notion, you could very easily return to a form of authenticity that would be problematic. And what Deleuze and Guattari try, Deleuze and Guattari try and do with their six points of, of rhizome is to begin to show how one moves within this enframing. And they're going to call it like a plane of eminence. This, this is. Is a plane of imminence, so it can, you know it can stretch out. But then, this is why it's complicated to call. Is to, to, you can say that this, that this is, um, you know, human being, and this is Dasein, but they both stretch. So that's the complication of just saying, you know, don't think of yourself as just you know this body like this. You also can stretch. You are the shore. Dasein's the other shore. There's a stretching. So that's why it's that's why they you'll see in Heidegger if you, if you get if you get really stuck into him where he starts going well what I mean is that I don't really mean human beings I mean entities but I don't really mean entities I mean human beings and you're like well, what do you mean and it's like you know make up your mind <laughs> what the idea is that you're wider you're even the, the the very act of being a being is different and hence 
the human being and the species being and the animal being, they're not very different beings. There's no, like, you need an opposable thumb to be human. This is not what Heidegger is talking about. If there is this relationship between appropriation of the Dasein to the, to the entity and vice versa, you've got a cat. You don't have to go to a human being. You've got a sentient being. A sentient being, whatever that is, can do, does this relationship. But then, so does the speed of light, which is hardly a sentient being. But I don't want to confuse you, so that was a horrible, cruel thing. All I'm trying to get you to think about here is that this thing is not just contained in this little, it's easier to think of Dasein as being all the way out there and the there and the that. But the entity, once you use the word entity, it just seems so specific. I just want you to think that it, can, it is specific. It's just that it, too, is ruled by these problems of dimension. So again, think of the file on your computer. It's ruled by dimensions, of, but you can see that it's actually a little something. It exists as such. OK, is that making sense? <laughs> And then got thinking onto geology. I don't know why. Okay, don't go there. <laughs> Although I have to say, the land that goes there. See, let me. How many people know what the word postmodern means? Truth question. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody answers. Okay, there's a wonderful book out by Leotard, uh, who invented the term called "Postmodernism Explained to Children." He's, he's, he's given up trying to explain this word 50 million times in his addresses. And obviously, if anybody was explaining to a child postmodernism the way he does, you just slap him. You know, I mean, it's, it's completely, you, you know, you have to be a little bit older than three to get it. Um, although I do think that Dr. Seuss is very helpful. Now, how many people ever, do, do, do you have Dr. Seuss over here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Green Eggs and Ham mm -hmm. is a real Dasein type book. You know, if, so, so if you ever end up reading this to anybody, including yourself, um, it's worth looking at it from the point of view of the being and entity. I used to have The Cat in the Hat Comes Back. That's another one of my favorite ones. Uh, that's a good one for um, just, well, just as being annoying. But you know how, does anybody know, Dr. Seuss as well as I do, does anybody know The Cat in the Hat Comes Back? Because The Cat in the Hat is a cat that has a hat that comes to this house of these children who are bored. And, and he comes in and he says, oh, so your mother's away, excellent. Uh, we can have some fun. And what we'll do is we will make pink something or other. And they make something pink, but then it spills. So they wipe it up with a cloth and then the cloth is all pink. So then they put the cloth in the washing machine and it bubbles up and everything's pink. And it just starts going. Now, I thought it was so fantastic that everything turned pink. Moment of silence appreciation of being gay. You know, the cat, who acts like this, you know? The cat in the hat comes and says, we're all going to be completely like you. And whatever you touch, it just grows and grows. And, okay, that's my own interpretation of the cat. The, <laughs> the point is, is that it, it just gets out of, it, it starts getting out of your hands. And how do you get, it, how do you get the genie back in the box? This is, this is his question. How do you, because mother is coming up the, up the walk. And how are you going to wipe up the thing? And how are you going to get this pink? to go away? How are you going to get it to be concealed? So there's the revealing and the concealing. You could really play with this a lot. Anyway, just think with Heidegger that the, the entity has a stretchy aspect to it, as does Dasein. And they appropriate each other. So in postmodernism, what Leotard does is he takes Heidegger. They all, they all are playing around with Heidegger. There's another good guy. Uh, for those of you that actually really do work in topology and dimension, there's a guy called a uh, double, double barreled last name, Lecou Labart, which is spelled L A C O U E. So Lecou. I'm sure it's pronounced much more sexily in French, but probably not Lecou. <laughs> Lecou. <laughs> Dash Labart. L A B A R T H E. Lecou Labart. That's his last name. His first name is luckily a short one, Philippe. Philippe Le Coulibart. And he wrote a book called uh, Topology. 
and it's got a subtitle, something like Mimesis and something else. And it gets into all the stuff. And Derrida has an introduction to it on uh, double negations and whatnot. It's very interesting about how, he's, how he explains this sort of next point that I want to talk about, about postmodernism. They're, they're all sort of trying to deal with Heidegger and what is it about Heidegger where he couldn't say sorry, where he couldn't apologize, where, you know, what is it about his work? So that being aside, Leotard writes this thing called The Postmodern Condition. And what he says, it's really a sociological book. It's, I don't know, for those, it's not philosophy. I mean, it is philosophy, but it, he says that this thing, he is, is the condition around which modernism exists. This thing, this is, this relationship, is a very specific relationship. It's, un it's not like uh, what was happening in uh, industrialism, but it is like what was happening in sort of the Greek world or different. So, so he basically says that postmodernism isn't just something that comes after modernism, but it's also something that came before modernism. So that's annoying because they call it postmodernism. It was just a very clever name. It just sounds good, really. But, but again, these people, they're so into their work that they have already gotten past the idea that the past, the present, the future all mean normal things. So post is the notion of post as in past, but also as in stake, also as in discourse. So, you know, they're way ahead of this. They're not thinking after modernism. That's probably the only thing they're not thinking about. So what he's saying is that the condition of modernity is that it hasn't happened yet. We have not become modern yet. Because what keeps happening is that these levels of appropriation and conditions keep getting messed up and will probably always get messed up because the concept of modernity is the concept and the actuality of getting there is a very different process. So for Leotard, he's arguing for the social agency, which Heidegger doesn't have in his thing. But again, it's a social agency that's not based on identity politics. It's, it's based on something very well, different, based on difference. And here's where it always gets difficult, because by saying different, it doesn't mean being a rebel. Although being a rebel, you kind of fall into being in the vat of difference. But just being a rebel isn't enough. That, 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 in fact, often, people who are rebels are just the flip side of what they're rebelling against. And that's not being a rebel. If you're really going to be different, then it's a whole nother ball game because you're, it's a different relationship of space and dimension, and form, and color, and tone, which has ramifications on the political, on the sociological, on the historical. You're making a face, Greg. Greg. So I was just in my mind without a cause and James didn't. OK, and what were you thinking? I was just thinking that that was more to that. Yeah, James I can see that. James is supposedly bisexual. So yeah. And what was he rebelling against? Blurring of his role in real life and dying in a car crash and Jesus can't be killed. <laughs> but no, but actually the you film. You say that very word. Really. Yeah. That's the first point. Well, I mean, one of the things that, uh, it's not to say that if you do something that is outside of this enframing, that it won't become sort of obvious. So, for example, a lot of people, male and female, female would, and trans and, and all the different entities, started wearing leather. Because to wear leather, it was like wearing a tutu or something. If you, it was saying something. If you walked down the street in a leather jacket, or for women when they walk down the street in trousers, I mean, nowadays they don't even think about it. But it wasn't that long ago that it was really considered unbelievable. And that you were either trying to impersonate a man, be a man, 
or make fun of men, or all three. Nowadays, it's kind of like, you know, are you crazy? <laughs> but the people who first did that were being rebels. Now, it gets swallowed up, so it, it, gets, it gets pulled back into the enframing. That's, that's part of this thing. So, what Heidegger does in chapter two, in the difference lecture, on the Hegelian, he starts off by discussing Hegel. And he, he tries to explain what we're going over now by saying that in the phenomenology of spirit, you have basically what I was explaining before, how you have identity that becomes this thought that that he, that, that it has an evolution to it, change is simply evolutionary. But what if you're actually able to understand how not not how the sporing happens, but that sporing happens, and because of that, one is able to connect the dots differently. The dots of sporing. This gets into what you were asking about with the rhizome. So the rhizome is that which sort of spores. So to put it slightly differently, you cannot wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to be a nuclear physicist. You have to have, there has to be some kind of learning some kind of experience that goes into that, I want to be a nuclear physicist today. But that you want to be a nuclear physicist at all is a possibility. It's just not a probability if you have no background about it. So this is a way of, of breaking down the, the notion of identity as coming with an identity and, and trying to to elbow your way in with your identity, saying, I'm here, I'm queer, I'm not going shopping. You know, it's, it's, it's the it's this other thing. It's, it's the kind of, once the show is over, once you go home and you, you know, I used to say to people, what do you think people who are wearing leather and, and engaged in various odd sexual practices are doing? What do you think they eat nails for breakfast? I mean, they eat breakfast. They eat coffee, they have coffee. You know, so when you go home and you, you know, it's all said and done, what actually sets up the identity? Again, it's this, it's this relationship. You, you never get out of the relationship. You might be dressed a certain way, you might not be dressed. So you're never out of this, this relationship to Dasein. Is this? But it's, so it's saying that the, that identity isn't a fixed thing, it's an ongoing thing. It's, it's not it's, fixed, but it's not not fixed. Yeah. And that's the, and that's where the naming comes in. Should the naming change as well? Of course, yeah. the naming does change. Yeah, all the time. All the time. So, for example, in the 17th and 18th century, or let's say 18th century, Western European version of female, to be female was to be this hysterical person. I don't mean funny. I mean like psychotic. And in fact, if you said anything. Uh, that even implied an intelligence, there was something wrong with you. It was this topological scenario. So obviously that's been broken down. And that was not just because people thought, you know, they walked up to people and said, you know, oh, you know, you're thinking wrong. <coughs> Let me explain to you what's going on. They go, yes, of course. You know, I see the light. No. How does this relationship change? Blood, sweat, and tears. You want to change the laws of physics? They're changeable. It's a perception, isn't it, as well? An experience that but changes. The, but the question is, how does the perception become real and not just one's opinion? <coughs> I'm okay. I mean, I used to ban the word perception in classes because uh, it really was just, it meant basically someone's opinion. How does it become a group perception? How does it become collective perception? How does it become Dasein? Because Dasein is only perception when it is in the social. See, if it's just your own opinion, then how does that actually well, operate? And then, I mean, you have things like your propaganda, protests, and there's media that gets messages out there, so then it's how that media is interpreted. Yes. Messaging, but this is at this, we're talking at a very fundamental level. Mm -hmm. I mean, which is not to say that propaganda doesn't come into it, but it wouldn't, 
we're talking about a secular form of naming, which used to be used to be called physics, or it used to be called something. In fact, in fact, when you actually, uh, if you have a chance, again on a Saturday, having a chance to <coughs> read *The New Science* by Vico. The New Science was written in 1642. In fact, actually, The New Science, which is fantastic about The New Science, it's not very new. Uh, he wrote something like 40 editions, because he kept changing it. I just love Vico. Um, and because it was, you know, just the early days of the printing press, you know, they'd print it off. And so, so be careful what edition you find, because he's had whole changes, you know, uh, about the, the New Science. But what, what he's saying in there is that Knowledge, the word knowledge and ciencia are the same word. And when it became divided so that there was divine ciencia and man's ciencia, because that was the only way it could be argued that God wasn't the only purveyor in town, then that ciencia started being called not knowledge but science. And the other one, the God one, stayed with the word knowledge. And then science sort of did its thing. And this is what Vico starts to explain. But knowledge, for reasons that were unclear, kept staying with God. And it really took a long time, like the 20th century, to start teasing away knowledge from God and making it secular and getting rid of God altogether. Now, that's not to say there is a God or there's not a God. I'm not saying that. I'm just, I, all I'm saying is that the understanding of meaning, and that's why I'm talking, so that's why propaganda is not quite, that's at this other layer. That, it's interpretation. Yeah, 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 so we're not talking about that yet. We're just talking about how does something get named? And I think it's helpful to think about the web in this sense. Anyway, it's certainly helpful. Here, here's where Heidegger's work, you know, starts to explain artificial intelligence. Or it helps to explain, it doesn't start to, helps to, because intelligence, from the robotic point of view, uh, from, the, from, robo, from robotics, isn't that it's programmed. Intelligence is not programmed. So that's the old way. If yes, go this way. If no, go that way. And then you have to have all the various zillions of combinations, and then you get how thinking can happen. That's very old, and that meant huge computers, big fans, this kind of thing. Now, one realizes that zero isn't nothing. Zero is the is. Zero is just what we've been talking about here. Zero is this bit here. And the one is the segment, which could have 5,000 ones in it. It have 5,000 segments, it's still a one, it's still a segment. So it doesn't mean the number one as such, just like <coughs> zero doesn't mean nothing. It means the enframed environment. That can explain how you put an image, can't it? Because an image on a computer, that what it does is it says, oh, there's some blue there. It's not each individual pixel again, it's all that blue. That's right. And therefore it reduces it down to that's right. And then it can, once it does a certain co level of combinations, because then you need a feedback loop, but that, that's another algorithm that you don't need to think about at the moment. Uh, in fact, we're not even talking about it. I'm just going to say the A word now, algorithm. Okay, you've heard it. Okay, now don't freak out about that, because we're not going to deal with it for another week or two. So it's okay. Today it's a free, it's a free present algorithm. Present. Okay, but, but at the moment, we're only at A equals A. We're still in baby steps. We haven't gotten to anything beyond that yet. Okay. But in computing, the way that, that one starts to understand how this A equals A, this, this inframing bit matters, how it creates matter, how it creates the is, is that one begins to understand how it feeds back into the infinite, that the, the, the segments feed back into the infinite and create this this kind of movement, which Mandelbrot calls fractals. Are you leaving for the time? No. <laughs> Sorry, just stretching my back. Oh, come out. <laughs> I can see everything. I have eyes in the back of my head. It's really quite sad. 
Okay, I'm actually one of these insects. But that's great. It's just an outfit I wear, so you don't get frightened. <laughs> okay, as I can zip myself up. Uh, okay, um, so learning is this relationship between the Dasein, let's say, and the entity, with the one, which is the entity, and the Dasein, which is the zero. But of course, we now know that the whole thing is Dasein. The whole thing is difference. So it's not so much depending on where you stand, because there's no standing. That's the problem. That's why perception is so difficult to talk about. Because there's a guy named Bergson. I don't know if you've heard of Henri Bergson. H-E-N-R-I, not Henry. Henri, Henri Bergson. It sounds so much better in French, even if I can't say it right. Henri Bergson, B-E-R-G-S-O-N. He wrote a book called Simultaneity and Duration, which if you're into this stuff, um, it's, a, it's a must read. And the thing is, he really thought that he had solved the problem of Einstein, and in fact wrote to Einstein about this, saying, just like you're saying, I've, I've figured out where perception goes in this kind of relationship. You know, if you're standing on a train station and you see the train moving in and out, it had this whole thing with the trains and you know, where the time is and you know this kind of thing. And Einstein writes him back, "Dear Bergson, <laughs> you are completely wrong. <laughs> I'm so sorry." And Einstein, uh, and Bergson was so ecstatic that Einstein had written to him that he was like, "You wrote to me. <laughs> it's great." He kept in this book. In fact, if you buy this book, you see the thing where he goes on about. Einstein has acknowledged his work, which is true. Okay, he just acknowledged his work that it was wrong. Okay, but it's like a tutorial with Johnny. That's right. That's right. Uh huh. You see his design. Okay. Question so far. Okay. If we have the relation A equals A, right? do we, to understand A equals A, to understand this A is, do we then create a relation between that and another that? Yes. And that would create kind of multi-dimensionality between yes. everything. Yes, and then we get into Stuart's question. Right, and then it goes Infinity. completely bonkers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now, did anybody understand that question other than the three of us? <laughs> Was it okay? Is it, is it? This is this is very hard stuff because what you're being asked to do is basically get rid of everything you know about knowledge, and now start thinking. I was going to say from the perspective of being an artist, but you are an artist, so okay. Uh, think from the perspective of the fact that you are. I'm going to talk about painting because that's what I'm going to talk about. Pretend you are the paintbrush. Pretend you're in a Walt Disney film, and you are the live paintbrush. <laughs> Sadly, what is that Merlin? I think. Uh, what's it? Fantasia. Has anybody seen it? Not on drugs. Okay. Um, anybody seen it so they can remember the film? Um, you know, he's the, the, the paint. The, the, the broom is going around doing its thing. Okay. Pretend you're this. This this thing. You're, and where does it go? What, how how does something with no, no with no brain make a decision. Because that's the idea of understanding the living aspect of the appropriation, of the event of appropriation. If your artwork is vibrating, if your artwork is, quote, saying something, that is not to say that the person looking at it is insane, or that they're just hearing voices. It is saying something. And when it coheres, when it, quote, works, it's created this kind of weird relationship that plays with the dimension. And if it's not doing that, then it's not going to be working. I've said this before. And so what I'm asking you to do in a, in a philosophy class is to forget about philosophy, sort of. You know, the lie. But I mean, forget about it in, a way, in, the, way, in the sense of don't think about it as a model. Use it as a voice to help you uh, give substance to your art. Th because bad forms of philosophy give you models and then say, go off and apply them. But life gives you models and tells you to go off and apply them. 
And a lot of times the models it gives you are ones that then you get in trouble for because you're not doing them right. Or, you know, you figured it out differently or whatever the story is. So this is, a, this is an immersive form of philosophy. This is, an, this is asking you to, to understand how this is is operating. The is is your work. The is is the, the curiosity. But it's not just this vague thing, curiosity. There's a technique to it. You've got to be good at what you do. Not everybody can do the artwork, actually. Not everybody gets the relationship between a line and their hand and your eye. People don't, there's, like a, there's a technique to this. You must study. You must learn it. You must, you must learn. You must be awake to it. And that's what Heidegger was talking about. You must be awake. And that's a poetic. He's talking about it in this language called poetics. I feel like I'm like, I feel like I'm giving a speech now. I don't mean like that. Let me just see if I've covered everything I need to cover. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, I left out one of the major things here. Um, yeah, okay. okay. So now what Heidegger suggests, and I would go as far as say this is what happens in your own work. It certainly happens in my work. Um, others, but, um, is that one has to learn how not to be afraid whilst remaining terrified. Something like that. You can't be so like, oh well, well, well because that's not going to work. You have to, you have to be thinking with your genitals. You have to be thinking with something that's very sensitive about your body. It, by that I don't mean that you have to be, you know, a jerk. I mean exactly the reverse. You have, you have to remember that everybody in this room has genitals. I like saying that because um, because it's very different than saying everybody has feelings. This really carnalizes the feelings, so you get it, so you can feel it. You get the, you know. Um, I was watching MasterChef the other day. <laughs> you might have to get out more, obviously. And this poor guy chopped off his finger, but believe me, I could relate to it because I've done, you know. And it brought back the horror of how painful that was and how I ran up and down the flat stairs for no reason just because it was like something out of a cartoon. Um, and, I, and I thought, yes, how do I bring this to the class, this level of, I don't mean pain for pain's sake, I really can't stand it when philosophers go on about the importance of suffering. It's like, oh, get a life, you know, it's like, I, there's also laughter, there's also pleasure. And this is, by the way, why I like Foucault over Derrida, with respect to the Derridians up there, because Foucault speaks about pleasure, not desire. It's a very interesting difference. It's not the desiring subject, it's pleasure. What gives you pleasure? And it, you don't have to go to the genitals, obviously, for pleasure, but it's not such a tragedy if you do. Whatever makes you wake up to the fact of pleasure as a movable feast, as a moving entity. So this form of the sensuous the pleasure, by which we can also include pain and anger, and misery, if you feel more comfortable. But it also includes <coughs> joy. There's a really good book called Sexus, S-E-X-U-S, by a famous writer. Mm -hmm. What is his name? Sexus, Nexus, Plexus. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh. I know! <laughs> Sexus, Nexus, and Plexus. Um, he's a bit of a misogynist. I know. Okay. Uh, uh, Miller. That could be. Yeah. It. Is it Henry Miller? No, it's not Henry Miller, is it? I don't think so. Anyway, in Sexus, like the first line of it starts off, you know, Cry and the whole world cries with you. Laugh and you laugh alone. <laughs> Everyone loves misery. You know? Now that is not to say there are not horrible things happening in the world. Again, this is the Foucault position. 
you know, just because the thing you're fighting against is abominable and disgusting, and you have every right to be upset and every right to be depressed, doesn't mean that should be the basis of theory of, of how you go forward. Because believe me, there's more energy in going forward when you do something out of joy and pleasure than out of just weeping and gnashing of teeth. Although anger is a useful, never lose your anger. These are, the, these are what's being said. Learn what it is to talk about the senses, how they are to be embodied, how, how your brain is actually in your fingertips. This is why I like uh, uh, Hannah's work, where you're doing the, the lesbian sex organs or whatever it is with the fingers. Um, because it, uh, it remembers thinking differently in the body. There's a whole thing in dance right now that's going on. It's very interesting where a lot of the uh, choreography has gotten rid of the head completely as the, as the font of knowledge. And of course, Bataille, B-A-T-A-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, George Bataille, um, he wrote about uh, a cephalic, a, a cephalic uh, philosophy, which means headless philosophy, no masters. Didn't get very far, but anyway, he tried. Yeah. Where your whole body is speaking, where it's where it's an embodied body. It's not like there is the body and there is the mind. What comes first? They don't come first. Or if you know, it's the being that comes first that gives rise to the thought. Once you get this, you get how artificial intelligence operates. That the being gives rise to thinking, not the other way around. And it's a creepy thought, actually. We are so close to creating a world that is really wildly not attractive. Because let me say this with love, I am also attracted to this world. I'm attracted to that Dasein up there with the gadgets, you know. But what I'm trying to get you to think here is how, it, it, if you think with the genitalia, if you think with pleasure, and the genitalia can be located on the end of your nose. I'm not saying you have to literally go to the genitals, although that's not such a tragedy if you do. It, the, the, this way it operates is that it begins to create techna. So the, the other point that he's making in his identity and difference is that once you grasp this in framing, endurance, dwelling, event of appropriation, you get the ingredients of the technological age. So if you're going to fight the technological age, I mean, if you're going to have revolution in the technological age, best to use those ingredients that make up that age. I'm all for revolution just that there's only so many hours in the day. So you have to figure out where it works. So again, this, this is a sign that he's getting at this whole question of how being gives rise to thought, that gives rise to thinking. So he has another whole book out called What is Called Thinking. It's like 200 pages long, so this is the truncation of it. And, and basically what he's saying, I just want to Quote this is a quote from him. I think. Let me see if I can. <coughs> Actually, this is a quote from Stambar, page 13, where she writes in talking about Heidegger thinking is not the upper story of the split level being that is the rational animal. That's not what thinking is. It's not some sort of upper story like the head of the right. And if it is, chop off the head, get rid of the head. Because the head thinking is the basis of patriarchy, is the basis of very specific forms of dictatorial power, is the very specific forms of leaders and led, the binary I keep telling you about, that is a very useful political tool if you happen to want power like that. Thinking is not the upper story of the split level of being that is the rational animal. Thinking in the form of the logos that Hegel had put forward has, for instance, brought about the whole world 
of technology in the atomic age, which is concrete enough. But that's not what technology is actually about. That form of thinking, the rational animal form of thinking, that form of thinking that is called science because people have demoted science or, or sterilized it. That includes the scientist. Although, actually, if you talk to a number of scientists, they're less sterilistic than the people approaching science who don't know much about it. But anyway, technology isn't just something that, what Heidegger wants to say is that technology isn't just something that the human being has acquired as an accessory. Technology is what we are, or as he puts it, what man is. Technology is what man is. Man is techna. And this is the postmodern condition. It's the condition of how this entity called human being emerges today. <coughs> so he says the how of how the human and the being, the Dasein and the being, the Dasein and the little bee being, the how of how those connect, that's the event of appropriation. It's a being appropriated. The staying apart becomes the framing, the enframing, the ability to get that so that it stays apart. It's not that you have to be worrying, Dasein is coming like a big marmite thing in the parking lot. Okay, it's not like you have to like, and, and when you think about it, a lot of the political action, <laughs> the next time you see that, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> well, there's a great book out called um, Something in the Blob, what was it called? Oh, boy, how to pick it. What's it called? Something in the Blob. Oh, I well, whatever it's called, Something in the Blob. Oh, The Attack of the Blob. That's what it's called, The Attack of the Blob. And she's really angry at Hannah Arendt. Uh, and so the book is it's sort of attacking Hana Arendt, and it's Hana Pipkin. Well, Hana's, you know, there's another shortage of names here, but anyway. So Hana P versus Hana A. Hana, Hana Arendt argues in her human condition. What Everybody's trying to ask the question, what is the human condition? And Heidegger changes it to what conditions the human to be. That's a reverse. What makes this thing called human be human? What can, not so much what is the human condition, which is already a very political question and it's an important question to ask, but what conditions human? And what part of the answer is, if you're coming from this friend versus enemy, male versus female, black versus white, social versus man, is that the society is understood as this big blob. So Hannah Pitkin makes the argument that their the political notion that gets developed is that you're fighting against society, and it's this big blob, and it's, you're always being attacked by it. And she basically says, that's just not the whole story. And if that is the whole story, the only thing that will engender is fear, and you won't know how to fight it. Because you'll be thinking, everywhere I walk, there's going to be another attack. The blob is coming. Whereas what she's actually saying, Pitkin, not Hannah, not, not, not around, what Pitkin is saying is that the attack of the blob allows for a certain, not complacency because it blames the victim, but it doesn't enable, it doesn't empower when you have that notion of blob versus little poor you. What is the victim? What is being harmed? But that uh, approach to solving it requires what he calls a leap out and an enframing. That's very hard to get a leap out when you're being attacked by a blob. Because in fact, if that's what's happening, you need to, you know, there's a, you know how do you get your distance? When I had my finger chopped, how do I get my distance from it? You know, I, I thought, I will never survive torture. I mean, not that <laughs> these are things I worry about. You better get arrested. Will I ever survive torture? No, I won't, you know. Example A, you know, thumb gets cut, for example, you know, can't even think through anything, you know. So it, it, 
But is it possible to have a society that is primarily um, reproducing itself via this situation, via Dasein versus you know, and the entity, as opposed to uh, the binary? And under the digital age, it is possible. In fact, it's not only like possible, it's what's happening. And that's causing a lot of consternation to a lot of folks who would like it to go back to leaders versus blood. And are doing everything possible to make it do that. Now, um, let me just make sure I've got the rest of this. Oh yeah, okay. Last thing, and then we'll go to the art opening. I'm going to a question. Is that he talks I haven't set this up enough for you to understand it clearly, I don't think. What he, Heidegger makes a comment in the second lectures that says that difference isn't meant to mean, well, difference and also the conception of concealing. Because difference is not obvious. But he says it's not a forgetting. There's no forget, this is not, it's an oblivion in the sense that it's, it's not within reach, but it's not oblivion, it's not, not a forgetting. And it's, it's, he says that basically forgetting belongs to difference, but it isn't difference. I'm just throwing that out so you can hear it, uh, because it requires a whole other discussion on that how that gets uh, set up. Lastly, Heidegger talks about this thing called the overwhelming. The overwhelming, the underwhelming. He never actually talks about the underwhelming, which I think is quite funny. But he talks about the overwhelming. And the overwhelming for him is, and pardon me, well, yeah, the overwhelming is when, I'm just trying to think, yeah, okay. The overwhelming is the fear of Marmite attacking you. Okay, I think that's the best way of putting this. He doesn't quite say it like this. Okay, obviously there's no Marmite this time. Probably doesn't have the humor to do it, but anyway. Overwhelming is this thing, and it's, difference that, that creates the ability to keep it apart. The overwhelming and the arrival. <coughs> to keep these two entities apart. Now, because I'm trying to tell, talk to you about this on a philosophical level, but also on a political level, and finally on an aesthetic level, that's a lot to take in. Because there's it's so many easy ways that this could just sound deeply not political or, or anti-political, in fact. Um, so I'm just, I'm just throwing these out so you can hear it for the moment. And then start thinking in your own work, how is it that your work can, can show an overwhelming, or can, can be involved in an overwhelming, and at the same time not be overwhelmed in it? Okay. Like, for example, um, I would say, uh, social realism, to me, is when the overwhelming has become so overwhelming that it just, it just becomes a bit boring. That kind of work. Sorry, that leads into social realism here. Uh, so that you have when, political art, when it's really emphasis on political, like politico, tends to have the overwhelming louder than the arrival, as you would put it. If you can keep the, the two, not equal, but just apart, they don't have to be equal footing, then it will work as art. Otherwise, it will become something else. It'll serve a different purpose. But for it to work as art, it has to have this kind of poetic, it's, he calls it a poetic, this, this muscularity that allows for the putting, pulling it apart bringing together, but not so together that it collapses. Does 
that make any sense? Are we, did I just kill it in that last little bit because you were doing this? I could tell that you were following up until this last little overwhelming, underwhelming, oblivion moment. What I kind of said, I see this book here called The Unseen. This is um, a work by one of our, uh, I don't know if you know him actually, Joshua Jean. Have you met him? Joshua? His name is actually J-I-E-H-O-N-G, John, J-O-N-G. He's Chinese. Uh, and he has very brilliantly done uh, a, 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 an exhibition in China of uh, work that's come from London and Birmingham and anyway in the UK, <coughs> gone over to, to, um, to, to uh, one of the Biennales there, and has gotten people to think about art as the unseen. And at the same time has gotten oh, the Chinese art that's come over, well, this is not a thing called Chinese art, but just but to the degree to which this is a thing called Western art, this is what we're talking, coming over here. So where, where you are in the realm of how something works as art without saying without over saying itself. If it overstates itself, it's not working as art. So it's a very, I mean, you can open this later if you want to take a look at it. He just gave it to me, so I haven't actually looked at the pieces, but I've seen the different works that are in there. And they're quite um, amazing. And also, you should find him. I can't understand why people don't understand why they have the metal, the professors and whatnot here, to you know, really bother them, really go see these people. Demand them, demand their attention you know, to your work, because there are some very interesting artists here. Um, OK, <coughs> any questions so far? Is this just, are we in like some sort of like mad airport with things just going? What do you think? I, last week I kind of really got excited and felt I grasped everything and this week, no, but I'm not worried about it. <laughs> but does that mean you're less excited? I just haven't managed to make the connection to what I know. That's not a problem. I disappeared into the world of uh, uh, the third policeman or something. The third policeman? Yeah. Yeah, I know. O'Brien. And, and, and the, yes, becoming a little bit bicycle. <laughs> Does anybody know the third policeman? It's really worth reading. It's really great. It's called The Third Policeman uh, by. Um, What's his name? Fanny O'Brien. Yeah, Fanny O'Brien. Uh, and he, he is, um, he's my favorite James Joyce. I think he's more interested than James Joyce. I mean, I think James Joyce is wonderful, but a bit overrated. Um, he's great, the third policeman. But anyway, he, he has this like invisible thing that does everything. It's almost like the fly circus. That they, you know, that, that they, you, know, you have this circus. You, you heard that where people, you know, look, look what it's doing. <laughs> the whole thing is based on this. Anyway, Ed, what do you think? Can you, what are you hearing? Mm. I don't know. I'm I'm thinking about when you were talking about um, laughing together or crying together. Um, I thought about how a little baby in, in a room with other babies yeah. starts crying and they all cry together. So that sort of well, sleep deprivation for the parent or <laughs> empathic reaction. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, this is something to think about this whole notion of the collective something. The collective my dimension. My the, the, collect the, the collective dimension of the sensuous. It's very odd. What about? Um, I'm sort of so comfortable with these about the body, the performance and things, and where lots of improvised performance works and sort of within dance and yeah. theatre, and I was sort of thinking of the way that our child works. Well, that's true. Of yeah, Arto is uh, A R T A U G, because you know Anton and Arto, uh, Theatre of Cruelty. Oh, Burkhoff is great. That's true. Stephen Burkhoff, yeah. 
There's also a person named Leroux. Have you ever come to yeah. him? I think it's L E space R O I. I think it's how you pronounce Is that right? R O There is an X on that. Yeah, there's R O I X. That's it, R O I X. He's the one that does the dance where the head is. It, all the dancers are usually under blankets or something weird. And it's just fantastic. There's some really good set of performances going on at uh, the moment with the Patrick Center of the Dance Exchange. Huh. There's some real contemporary stuff going on. If you ring up, they'll let you go and watch rehearsals there. You don't always have to pay for the signature. Mm -hmm. Send it to Hippodrome. Oh, that's a Hippodrome as well. Yeah. In Birmingham. Just, yeah. But right. Patrick Center's next to it. Stuart, what are you hearing? Um, I've got that negative capability thing again. The virtual world. <laughs> just not going to let go of that thing. That's right. Well, no, it's just you, you sort of ended up on that. Yeah. Like, uh, but it was a different, I think he was talking about the process. Um, whereas it's also working for the, the output as well. Yeah. Um, you were saying about the piece of work, artwork to succeed. You know, I was just thinking because a lot of times when I see you and I, and I see Greg, I always think of uh, landscape. Sorry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you know, and I think of, <laughs> and I think of um, going outside and smelling spring. And that moment when you know spring is coming even though there's snow, even though it's cold and raining and I came in all wet. Um, this is the moment where you can create a kind of fusion or something, where the senses begin to articulate the place, the space, the timing. It's this, it's this way in which that brings then the meaning, not the other way around. It's not like you're thinking spring is coming and now I'm going to have spring come to this entity. It's that you get how it operates and then it creates an explosion. <coughs> so it's not a negative capability, that's what I'm trying to say. It's, it's, it's this entity that requires difference, but difference is, is a zero or difference is a, is a elsewhere. It doesn't mean negative. Try and gently move you away from that side of it. John, what about you? What are you hearing? Um, you notice I'm asking everybody. Did, yeah. Okay, so let's <laughs> <just> compare <laughs> this side of the room. Oh, I can't believe it's worth this. Um, I'm, I'm trying to get it to apply to what I do. Okay, yeah. that, that's a good question to be asking. Um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying to, I don't know why I'm stuck on it, but I'm trying to imagine this A to A because it's written flat and it's not flat. It's as it goes. Yeah. It's kind of like rising. Yeah, of yeah. Thing, yeah, nice. It's not really because inside A to A it's another A to A and there's a babushka ah, the policeman lives. <laughs> yeah, yes. And the babushka thing and, and <laughs> the babushka. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it's it's kind of it's everywhere. And then you imagine it in three dimensions, it's not in three dimensions because there's X dimensions and uh, you know, it, it kind mm -hmm. of, that's quite interesting. Yeah. Huh? And then how time doesn't really exist within it. And right. One we push and we create identity like within time, that doesn't really exist. Like it's here and here, and then suddenly we create an identity between those two. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm That's trying good. to imagine Complex. that. Hmm. Okay, Clovis, what about you? Uh, yeah, because I think because I'm, I because uh, I I tend to because you put the dark signs and you know 
I tend to use a Chinese philosophy that you okay. know, and, and you know this thing need this thing. This, you know without this thing, this thing is not as you know. Uh huh. I, I, and when you say Chinese philosophy, what what do you mean? Yeah, the philosophy of like you know the you know the. Do you mean Tao? Yes. Yeah. Mean... yeah. It's like, you know, uh, by itself, this thing is not... Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And it's very much the case. I mean, it's, it's what it, it's, it is trying to borrow from, in this case, the Greeks. And, you know, it depends on where, what your perspective is. It's Greek, East or West, mm. you know? It's, a, it's an interesting problem. Anyway, it's, just, it, 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 it's considered Greece is the founder of the Western civilization. And for that, it gets to be kicked out of the EU. You know, see what happens when you rise to the occasion. Always be careful. Um, interesting. Okay. Luke, what are you hearing? Um, this difference in ages, this difference in historical time, which is probably the wrong way to read this, the move from the atomic age to the information age. Yeah. You're saying that it's, um, it's achieving this. I thought I saw it as a failure. As far as the zeros and ones, is the re-entry into binary rather than the escape from binary. Yeah. There's something in that that I want to explore. Yeah, because the zero and ones, from the point of view of artificial intelligence, is escaping. From the point of view of it re returning to us versus them, a contradiction, uh -huh. it goes back to the atomic age question. With the information age. With the information age, technically. Because the information metaphor and the reading of the human as information based, as language based. Well, that's, that's, that's your link. The question is is information based the same as language based? Okay, and that's, that's, that, that's No, that's interesting. That's quite, that's quite interesting. Mm. Good. Hannah, what are you thinking? Um, I'm connecting this to um, the process of making and how. That word visceral sort of works within within that, and then the whole idea of the, everything, the the dwelling, the surface, the depth, the durance is, <coughs> is is happening while you're while you're making. Or particularly, I'm thinking about the piece of work I'm making at the moment, and how how relevant that is, and how you kind of you're making these marks with a background thought, but there's something else driving you as well. <coughs> <coughs> hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah, I was just interested in this headless philosophy. It's a headless philosophy, yeah. yeah with the dance. And cephalitis, uh, a cephalitis. A A E C. Yeah. A E S C. And I was thinking of the Rose's dance company. Oh. Which always makes me think it's a really the head, but I need to put that Yeah, out. that's oh, interesting. Mm. 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 I was also trying to make a connection with puppets. With the puppets, yeah. And, and um, I was thinking that all the connections that you, you have with, like, like, I was thinking kind of the horizon. Yeah. With the lines that are connected. You that connect you and the puppet. And I like you said uh, thinking with uh, a different part of your body. Yeah. So if I'm operating, for example, marionette, it's, it's, it appealed to me like I would think with my hand or yeah. something, with my puppet, maybe. So hmm. I'm like thinking. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, how could I? And, if, and this thing with the techno, that. Um, when a puppet really is uh, the technology of, to, to think how the technology of the puppet is and that um, how it if it works it's if the, the audience will look at it and want to look for example the operator and yeah. and what the uncanniness that mm -hmm. it will create and then it's art Interesting. Mm -hmm. So and the uncanny it, uh, is difference for you in that sense. It's it's the 
So there is no time, but if I want to create something, I would need time and space and ground. So it's I could do it in that way with technology, but mainly I would like to use all these elements that are not in this theory. So mm -hmm. it's kind of I don't know that's frustrating. That's, no, but that's that's interesting. Hmm. Greg. Um. I think a lot about Peter K. Dick. Okay, yeah, so <laughs> that's hilarious. I've read, I've read for a long time, <laughs> and he's been my sort of guiding light of. Existence. Can you tell people who this is? Wrote Blade Runner, Drew, Drew Android's Dream Electric Machine, uh, New Big, lots of books. Yeah. But his ideas was that memory was central to identity, so most of his books have been based on the head. And all of a sudden, I'm back on headless. Yeah. And all these, these films and books and things that I've read and the idea of implants and memory being stored and so on, I just completely, well, because I guess of technology, because, I don't know, it's just, and this, is, this came before Pink came in, whether he was aware of it or not, that the order has just gone out for me, and I'm, oh, I'm, enjoying, I'm enjoying the fact that all that's questionable. Now. Yeah. Huh. Which is really yeah. yeah. different type of sensing. Yes. It's only different types of sensing, you know, yeah. the emotion. Yeah, and it's not linked to the body at all, it's just here. Yeah. With the other reading I've been doing about the you know, body memory, um, <coughs> it, it just doesn't work like that. The body, is, the brain is just not a separate thing. It's just yeah. Not separate this is place. where, like, for example, have you come it's across the artist named Stellar? Mm -hmm. No, I don't know. Well, he plays around different uh, body parts, literally, on his body that can given their location on the body, manifest the body, make the body work differently. And so, like, again, I mean, if you could have a prosthetic head on his knee, probably would figure out how to do that. And it would, like, be a very different way of thinking, but it would still be thinking without the head. Yeah. You know, so he's very, he's quite good at that, yeah. Didn't he let himself be wired up to the computer in other people control his movement. Yes. So yeah. He and he's great. So he it's great. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, well, I was. I feel a little bit lost with my work at the moment. So obviously, um, aspects of what you have been speaking about today were quite interesting in terms of the, you know, the quality of really just to keep going with that lostness. And yeah. Yet, you know, in some ways, not freaking out, but in almost learning to like it yeah. and see an opportunity within it. Yeah. I think as elements of that within that. And then another uh, question, but I don't, I haven't really thought through it because I'm reading uh, Joseph Walsh at the moment. Oh, right. I'm, I was <coughs> just trying to say where does he fit in, obviously he doesn't really fit in. No, he does. Uh, Joseph Walsh is absolutely a... Do you think he, because I would have placed him more with the metaphysical, it's a long, we'll have that as an agenda item. I think we'll have that as a as a discussion in the course. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. His work is absolutely underwriting this course, this, this this actual course. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting that you found him. Yeah. Which which Joseph Boys are you reading? Well, I've, I've just started really, and it's called uh, "What Is On," which yeah. is a, a, an interview question answer section, and then there's an essay. Good. Okay, well, we have made it to the hour rather than getting out earlier. So I'm not sure if the art thing is still going on, but if it is, just cross the street. What's that? Not delayed. Okay, so I'll see you next week.